somewhere over Colombia, high above the Amazonian rainforest near the borders with Brazil. A DC-3, an old prop plane, is caught in a violent tropical storm. Captain Raul is trying to get above the clouds. San Jose, come in, we're entering your airspace. No visibility and no reply on the radio. And no question, flight 3037 is in trouble. To stabilize the twin-engined aircraft, Raul tries to bypass the worst of the storm. But amidst the turbulence and without radio contact, he seems unable to get back on the right flight path. His co-pilot Maria also appears to be lost. In the rear, the passengers are growing increasingly uneasy. But Colombians are fatalistic and, above all, fervent Catholics. Flying is risky and it does scare me. But I trust in God and the man who's flying this aircraft. Fortunately, the ancient DC-3 has a guardian angel, Tito the mechanic. He checks every suspect noise, and on these old DC-3s, the mechanical problems are frequent and sometimes fatal. On flights like these, the greatest danger is not the storm or mechanical faults. It's the jungle 2,000 meters below. The Amazon jungle, a green hell. An impenetrable jungle, twice the size of Texas. And the pilot's greatest fear Below, there is no space for emergency landings. Any breakdown will mean the plane will crash, and then it's curtains. Several dozen planes have disappeared into the jungle. Swallowed up by the vegetation, they are rarely, if ever, found again. It's one of the most perilous air routes in the world. Jumping off point is Villa Vicencio. The destination is any one of the number of Indian villages scattered throughout the jungle and cut off from civilization. Divine intervention, or the skill of Captain Raul, means the plane has succeeded in steering clear of the storm. The passengers will arrive as scheduled at Akarikwara, a small Indian village. The runway, or what passes for one, is in view. Here there is no control tower. Everything is done the old-fashioned way as it was back in the 1920s and 30s. Intuition, judgment and experience. The landing zone is slippery and pitted with holes. It's also way too short. Pilots need to be able to land virtually right at the start of the runway.
Entonces uno lo trae con poquita velocidad y sienta ruedas. I reduced the speed as much as I could. I landed right at the start of the runway, so the wheel's friction would help me bring the plane to a halt. It slid a bit, but it wasn't too dangerous. About a hundred people live in Akarikwara. The plane's arrival, it stops here only once or twice a month, is a major event. Without the DC-3, the village would be completely isolated and getting enough food would become a problem. If the plane didn't come here, the people would starve to death. There are other alternatives, like the river, but it would be a lot more complicated. How long would it take to come by river? Ooh, at least three or four days. The village is a two-week walk to Mito, the nearest town on the border with Brazil. It's not much of a place, barely 20 houses. There's a church and a boarding school which takes in the Indian children from the jungle. Tranquilo, tranquilo, Pacho. Alfredo Camargo is the headmaster and has taught here for eight years. He's a little depressed today. Over the years, his various attempts to boost the village economy have all ended in failure. Este tractor, eh. Last year, this tractor was purchased in Mitu. It took us 45 days for us to get it here. You see, the idea was to construct a road so that the people could get about and transport their goods. But uh, it's been sitting here, rotting away for more than a year. The Indians have the same lifestyle as their ancestors, hunting, fishing and growing local produce. This is where we keep what we produce locally. There are plantains, yuccas, as well as the supplies that have been flown in on the plane, like rice, sugar and pasta. There's enough to last quite a while. And we've even traded some of it with the Indians in return for their bananas and yuccas and pineapples. And we give them soap, salt, matches, candles, things like that. Out here it's a total barter system. Captain Raul never spends more than 15 minutes on the ground, just long enough to unload. He wants to steer clear of the crowds of children who get in the way of taking off, but mostly he wants to avoid flying at night. See, the kids don't realize the danger. They run around playing on the landing strip like it was their playground. They have to take great care when they're scattered around in front of a plane like this. Return flight to Villa Vicencio. For two hours, the plane will overfly the jungle again. The passengers aren't comfortable. If they were to crash, their chances of survival are slim. Even if they did survive, the wild animals and conditions, they would face another danger. The fuck. The guerrillas of the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia. It's believed their forces number about 10,000, making a living from holding prisoners for ransom. Numerarse. Uno, dos, 
Tres. Compañía. Retira. ¡Cambio! Ingrid Betancourt was held here for six years. But since the election of President Uribe, the army has succeeded in liberating prisoners, such as this man, who was kept in a hole in the ground for years. After the two-hour flight, Villa Vicencio lies below. The town is in the foothills of the Andean Cordillera. DC-3s like the one flown by Captain Raul are the stuff of legend. There are still about a 100 that fly regularly. They were first built more than 70 years ago and have survived war and old age, more or less. That's where the number of flight hours are recorded. We're up to 20,450 hours. During the war, the flight data wasn't recorded. It only began when we started taking passengers and freight, when civil aviation began, really. How old is this aircraft? I think it was updated in 1962, according to this panel. In truth, there's no date written anywhere. And as surprising as it may sound, Captain Raoul doesn't know the plane's exact age. 30 are still operational here, and Villa Vicencio is the world's capital of these ancient DC-3s, one of the few planes capable of dealing with the conditions of flying in the Amazon jungle. However, accidents do occur. A monument at the entrance to the airport pays tribute to the high cost in lives of aviation in these parts. In 20 years, over 200 pilots and passengers have perished. A very heavy price paid for the result of rains, dirt landing strips, and in particular to mechanical breakdowns. The aircraft are due to permanently retire soon. Half the aircraft are always on the ground, undergoing repairs. Such as flight 1149, owned by the Sedelka airline. It should have taken off this morning, but the port engine wouldn't start up. It's not a serious problem, according to Jose, one of the plane's two mechanics. There's a slight oil leak. We'll seal it off and then we'll do a quick test flight and then everything should be fine. Jose seems confident, yet he was on board the same plane 18 months ago when it had to make an emergency landing in this paddy field a few kilometers from Villa Vicencio. The DC-3 is the only one that has two onboard mechanics. The left engine had a problem with its cylinder. It spluttered and then it just stopped. We had cargo and 15 passengers on board. We opened the emergency exit and threw out all the cargo. Then the other engine shut down and the captain decided to try and landing it here in the paddy field. We landed okay, but the propellers were destroyed and the undercarriage ripped off, but we survived. Today, the same left engine is playing up again. 
The fault is located after a short period. It appears to be the pump. In the US, to fix the pump, they take the entire engine off the plane. Here in Colombia, we're quicker. We fix it right there and then. There doesn't seem to be much concern in the airline's offices either. Flight 1149's pilot is Captain Fajardo. Seems like the flight is late? Yes, a little bit. They happen often. No, it's just a bit of routine maintenance. Just a slight adjustment in the engine. Nothing serious. But the repairs are taking longer than expected, and the passengers appear distinctly uneasy. They say the planes are very safe, but when you see it like that, it's scary. Five hours later, and after much hesitation, the flight is finally cancelled. There's always a problem. There's always something wrong. Two weeks ago, on a Sedelka plane, there was an accident, and the propeller broke. People were stranded in the middle of the Amazon for a week. We wanted to charter, but that plane broke down. What was wrong with it again? There was the propeller. The propeller wasn't powerful enough to take off, and they had to cancel that flight. And today we've been here since 7 in the morning. It's midday now, and they've just announced there's a problem, and we won't be able to fly. Sadelka isn't smiling either. The engine has a serious problem. It needs to be dismounted and taken to the workshop 200 meters away. It's not just the pump, it's probably something else. It might take a day to fix it, but if it turns out to be more serious, it could take as long as one or two weeks. The storm certainly won't help matters either. There's a power cut. But that won't stop our two geniuses, however. In Colombia, the light from a mobile is enough to repair a plane's engine by. The storm means Raul and Maria won't be working either. If we don't fly, we don't get any wages. So the more we're airborne, the better. We don't get a penny for just sitting around like this. Captain Raul is paid far less than a regular airline pilot, yet he still has heavy responsibilities. He has to organize the flights and find the passengers. Flights are ad hoc. There's no real flight schedule. With departure times, as such, on a given day, we need to get enough cargo or passengers, and when it's full, off we go. It's only at the last moment that we know we're, that we're actually flying or where we're flying to. We get one hour's notice at the most. To load the plane, Raul relies on this man. Pablo is a shipping agent, and he's the one who brokers all the air transport into the Amazon jungle. 
para, para mí tú, venían 106 There's kilos. about 120 kilos for ah, Mitu, and there's 450 kilos from Vilao that's going to Miraflores. Sí. That's 120 kilos, uh, plus passengers. Sí. Despite the unpredictable weather, the captain has decided to fly. The pouring rain may have penetrated the petrol tanks, something that could cause the engines to shut down in mid-flight. We check by taking a sample to make sure we don't need to drain the tanks so as to get the rainwater out. The petrol is clean though, so it's a green light. After that, the plane is loaded. This is when the captain and the shipping agent wrestle over the payload. To make more money, Pablo tries to lie about the weight. But Raul is keeping an eye on him. The plane can carry no more than one and a half tons. Any more, and the captain will simply refuse to take off. It's dangerous. The slightest problem, and the plane will just fall out of the sky. That's why we have to watch the weight of the cargo, because if something breaks down, then we'll have enough time to keep flying and to be able to jettison any superfluous loads so we can complete the flight. Vegetables, beds, dogs, chickens, TV sets. In Colombia, DC-3s look more like rural buses. Anything is transported even cocaine. And the police check to make sure there's none on board. With fuel kept to a minimum, each extra kilo counts. Too much fuel and the plane will be too heavy to take off. Not enough and it could mean a crash in the jungle. One hundred and forty. Is that enough? No, 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 no. Well, just about. There's just enough to get there. Judging the exact amount of fuel is a constant worry for the captain. How much more do we need, Captain? Uh, we've put 20 in here and 20 at the back. That's 150 plus 20. That's 170. It's a small town in the middle of the Colombian jungle, the landing strip, the main thoroughfare. Until recently, however, Miraflores was notorious for being a drugs capital, under the control of cocaine traffickers and of the FARC. Please don't get off the plane. Yeah, and if you do get off, make sure you don't film. The captain doesn't want us to film because these days Miraflores is under the control of the army, who are sensitive about security. The military are everywhere. Once upon a time here, there used to be 12, 13, maybe even 14 flights every day. Now there's only two flights a week and the occasional small plane. Thank you. 
One reason there are so few flights is that over the past 10 years or so, its inhabitants have slowly abandoned the village. We filmed the Miraflores back when cocaine ruled supreme. It had become an El Dorado and a golden age for the DC-3. A plane landed every 50 minutes, loaded down with supplies and with fortune hunters. Watch out, watch the runway for horses, or cars, people. Yeah, take care because the approach is delicate. The runway is not being cleared, I'm going to have to step on the gas again. Four thousand people lived here in this town, which had sprung up from nowhere. There was a huge amount of drugs money floating around. People from all over Colombia flocked here to make their fortunes. It was Colombia's Wild West, transforming the muddy streets into brothels and other dives. Here in Miraflores, there's a bit of violence, a bit of drug trafficking, there's a guerrilla war. There's police, murder and prostitution. And there are huge fields of coca plants all around the town. It's the local speciality. And this is an illicit cocaine lab. There are still hundreds more like this one scattered throughout the jungle. The farmers use them to produce base cocaine, known as pasta, which they then sell to the drug traffickers. The substance is then shipped by boat or plane to more sophisticated laboratories to be refined, and then smuggled into Europe or the United States. Hey, Luis, have these leaves already been mashed? No, we're about to do that next. We collect the leaves and then we mix them with the lime. Then they marinate in this container for about 40 minutes. This is uh, water mixed with kerosene, and we add about 20 centiliters of acid. Later we add ammonia to separate the coca and whiten it. Now, otherwise you could filter it through this cloth. What's left is the base, what we call the pasta. Here in Miraflores, we get about uh, 15 euros a gram. This is about 150 grams. So it's worth uh, 300 euros. We get about a kilo a hectare, which brings in about 2,000 euros. But my expenses are about 600 euros. Well, I don't have that much of a profit. It's the people that send it abroad that make a lot of money. We don't really earn much from it. Just enough to live off and maybe buy some Christmas presents. The military were sent in and a pitiless war erupted. 
It's a bit like Vietnam here sometimes. In Miraflores, the cocaine lords ran everything, openly challenging the authority of the government. And the state also wanted to weaken the FARC, who had made cocaine their main source of revenue. The army intervened in a ruthless, wide-scale series of offensives including commando raids in the center of town, right among the civilians. The war ended with the destruction of the secret labs. Tons of cocaine went up in smoke. Traffickers were killed or arrested. And the FARC guerrillas driven back into the jungle. Few DC-3s fly in or out any longer especially when they miss the landing strip like this one. At the repair hangar in Villa Vicencio, the mechanics have taken just one night to repair the engine of Sadelka Flight 1149. There's still the tricky job of fixing it back onto the wing and to make sure it runs smoothly. You have to wonder about an engine that's in this state. Yeah, it works though, thank God. Yeah, gave me quite a headache though. Captain Fajardo will take the plane up for a test flight. He's been flying DC-3s for seven years and knows this plane well. He's the one who crash landed in the paddy field a year and a half earlier. He meticulously checks everything before takeoff. The mechanic keeps an eye on the engine. So far, so good. On board, everything seems fine, and the crew is happy. Everyone's been concentrating on the port engine. When suddenly, it's the starboard engine that stops and then restarts. Inside the plane, there's a slight panic, but the DC-3 can fly perfectly well even with just one engine. The captain decides to land quickly, however, onto this makeshift airstrip.
John, ¿cómo va este motor? Bien, bien, bien. Dime, ah, dime. ¿Estás ah, preocupado? Yo estaba por allá, yo no vine de bien What's up, John? What's happening? No, I'm just checking the fuel pressure. Ben? No, it's okay, it's a bit low, but we can fix that. And the DC-3 is soon airborne again. Despite the imminent risk of another breakdown, the comforting drone of the engines soon sends everyone off to sleep. even the pilot. In Villa Vicencio, the storm has finally ended. Captain Raul and his crew are carefully preparing their next flight, and the captain is uneasy. He will have to land on one of the most dangerous landing strips in Colombia, and he's never been there before. Everything has to be worked out, the approach speed, and the precise place where the wheels must touch down. Uh, what if you get it wrong? Oh, it's simple. We'll crash or spin off the runway, which is right next to a ravine. Is it big? The ravine at the end of the runway is deep, about 80 meters. And the icing on the cake is that on this flight he will be transporting 1,800 liters of highly combustible fuel. The fuel attendant isn't pleased about us filming, fearing a spark from our equipment might set fire to everything. Okay, go ahead and film, but it is dangerous. Uh, with this hot weather, Anything could start a fire. And there'd be no way to put it out. We'd all get barbecued along with the plane. Libro de vuelo, switch de batería, switch de radio, válvula de estrella, palancaletas, palanca del tren. Libre y operando. Dos. 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 It's always nerve-wracking, especially the landings. When I see we're running out of airstrip and the brakes are on full, and we start to slide left and right. Uh, it just keeps going, though, and there's nothing we can do about it. Tito, the onboard mechanic, has removed the rear door. One short circuit, one spark, a violent bump, and everything could blow. We leave the door open so that the fumes can dissipate. We're carrying fuel, so it's crucial the plane is well vented, in the back and in the front, to avoid a buildup of gas in any one area. After an uneventful flight, the runway comes into view. Fortunately, visibility is excellent.
In Colombia, they're not the only pilots who risk their lives. Aguazul is a three-hour drive from Villa Vicencio. This is the Tilanos, or Great Plains region of Colombia, with huge herds of cattle and cowboys. Rice and cereals are also grown here. The area is the country's breadbasket. Shortly after five in the morning, Jose Gutierrez, a 46-year-old pilot, is about to take off. We have to check the brakes, then make sure that not even one screw is missing, that there are no cracks in any of the pipes. It's a matter of life and death, then. Sure is, we dice with death every day. Jose is a special kind of pilot, well known locally. He sometimes spots a car he recognizes down below, and like a fighter ace, flies perilously low to buzz the vehicle. A highly dangerous maneuver, just to impress his friends in the car. I think I have the most dangerous job in flying. Well, even more than in a DC-3? Yeah, I mean, in a DC-3, the takeoffs are dangerous because of the weight of the cargo and the power of the engines. But once the pilot's up above at 15,000 meters, if there's a problem, he has time to throw out the cargo. We, however, if the engine stops, we've got just 10 seconds to find somewhere to land, and there's certainly no time to jettison anything. Jose is a crop duster. His job is to spray fertilizer or pesticides on the fields. His chestnut is filled with these highly toxic chemicals. Each farmer concocts his own mixture. There are no controls. The aim is simply to be effective. Today, his task is to spray pesticides on these fields. And before that, he needs to find his bearings. So I go from here to... Uh, what's that then? That's a hill. And that's where we'll be planting today. And um, what's uh, there on this other side? Rice. To make it worth his while, Jose's tanks are filled to the brim with pesticide. There's so much, the plane has difficulty leaving the ground. The pilot has to steer between these two white flags to spray the right fields. To prevent the wind from carrying the pesticides elsewhere, Jose flies as low as possible. On average, Jose makes about a dozen flights a day, 12 takeoffs and landings. We have to keep on our toes the whole time. Danger can come from anywhere. We're flying just a meter above the ground, so we have no time to react, or barely anyway. We have to focus on the flags and the farmers, and at the same time keep an eye on the instruments. I have to remain aware of everything that's happening, inside and outside the aircraft.
mirar el lote, que no tenga cuerdas, que no haya... You have to make sure that there are no obstructions in the field, you know, someone walking across the flight path, or cow, or, or trees, of course, that might be in the field. To do all of that, you need to know what you're doing. Every time he stops to resupply is a race against time. Like a Formula One pit stop, each minute counts. You can't stop for longer than two minutes. Time is of the essence. Each minute costs me 20,000 pesos. Right now I'm off. At those prices, he doesn't hang around. But there's no routine in the skies, just danger everywhere, especially when there are power lines crossing the fields. Now that's really scary. And he often has little choice other than to fly below them. And at sunrise you can barely see the power cables. You need to be a bit crazy to do this job, don't you? Not a bit, completely. The list of crop duster pilots that have been killed is a long one. Jose has had some close calls, 13 serious accidents. I had two breakdowns in flight, three accidents taking off, and the rest while I've been working. Once when I was landing, a wheel broke, and the plane went head over heels. I wasn't even wearing my belt. When it was rolling over, the fuselage cracked, and so I could squeeze out of the gap. I had hit my head against the fuselage that time too. Did they drag you out? I was unconscious for about 10 minutes. It was like being drunk. They dragged me out and someone held my head, but I couldn't move it. That accident, Jose's worst, was in this very plane 18 years ago. He was young, cocky back then, and still a bachelor. <laughs> Things have changed now. He has a family. He and his wife Julia are the proud parents of an eight-year-old daughter and a newborn. <laughs> He's only 20 days old. I'd like to be around until at least his hand is as big as mine. It'll be a while though, 20 years at least. <laughs> Julia's happiness would be complete if her husband was not a pilot. When we were going out and then started living together, then I realized what I was dealing with. Before that, I hadn't. I'm always worried that I'll get a call one day to tell me the plane has crashed and something's happened to him. You've never asked him to change jobs? Yes, all the time. But uh, he just carries on flying. To earn a living, he needs to find something else to do, but not being a pilot. I'm always asking him to stop flying. Raising kids is much harder than flying airplanes. Airplanes don't control pilots, whereas children do. Here, partying is a tradition. Each Sunday, Jose and his family enjoy a barbecue with their friends. The music is the Canto Llanero, songs that pay tribute to the cowboys of this region of Colombia. The Flanos provide us with everything. They give me work in agriculture and a way for the others to make a living too. The music relaxes me, it's so wonderful. The words are about us and it makes me feel at one with the culture here. 
Every time I take my plane up, I'm always humming one of these songs. I usually have one of the tunes in my head when I'm flying. In the Clanos, there'll always be plenty of work for Jose, and his aerial antics will remain a feature for the foreseeable future. The DC-3s too are likely to keep flying for some time to come.